Hello everyone and welcome to round 7 of the 1960 World Chess Championship match between Mikhail Tal and Mikhail Botvinnik. Now I hope you all enjoyed game 6, uh, that was uh, one of the greatest games ever played in a World Chess Championship match, especially the Knight F4 move. Uh, but uh, as everyone else in the world was busy analyzing that move, Tal and Alexander Koblenz had other plans. As after game 6 it was a rest day, so they had a, ver a very busy day and they had to figure out how to counter Botvinnik's uh, Karo Khan defense in game 7 as uh, according to the previous games where Botvinnik had the black pieces he will not uh, choose any other opening but the Karo Khan defense and if you've seen my video on game 5 then you, you've noticed that after Botvinnik played e6 in the Karo Khan defense uh, Tal started considering a bishop sacrifice on e6 and uh, he didn't find any good continuations for white during the game uh, but uh, he did find some after the game in his home preparation uh, but uh, Botvinnik also, as he is a master of home preparation, uh, uh, thought thought about the, the bishop sacrifice on uh, e6, and uh, he decided uh, to, to choose a different line of defense for Karo Khan. So uh, let's see this game, and although Tal was uh, two points up in the match so far, this is game 7, he says that uh, he still can't afford to play safe as it's like impossible to draw all the games to the end just to win by his two point lead, uh, he will still have to create some interesting games. So uh, Tal of course opens with e4, uh, c6 of course by Botvinnik, the Karo Khan defense, d4, d5, knight to c3. Uh, D captures on e4, knight captures on e4, bishop to f5, knight to g3, everything is the same as in game 5, uh, bishop to g6 and uh, knight to e2. Like in game 5, uh, uh, Tal is preparing knight to f4, uh, but here instead of e6, Botvinnik started thinking and Tal says he was thinking for about 6 minutes. And after 6 minutes he played knight to d7. Uh, knight to d7 uh, is an idea in the Karo Khan that uh, black wants to uh, push e5 immediately. He doesn't want to go e6 and uh, go for the standard Karo Khan setup. And uh, now if Tal would continue knight to f4, uh, then e5 pretty much solves all of his problems. Uh, now you capture, 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 you can capture the bishop, uh, and after bishop to e3, it's a pretty, pretty decent position uh, for black and both for white, uh, but definitely a position Botvinnik would favor. His pawn structure is a bit ruined here, but he does have an open h file for the rook, so a pretty equal position. So after this knight to d7 move, Tal immediately goes for h4. He's waiting with knight to f4. Uh, h6, you can't allow white to push h5, and only now knight to f4. Uh, here Botvinnik can't push e5 like I've shown in the previous variation because now knight captures on g6 would force black to capture with the f1. Uh, so bishop to h7 and now bishop to c4. And Botvinnik goes for e5 as uh, this is the whole idea of playing knight to d7 to push uh, e5 early. Uh, queen to e2. And this queen to e2, Tal thought that uh, entering the endgame would be much favorable for him. Uh, but uh, later... Uh, after this game, Tal only realized that he already played this game a couple of years ago and uh, that he came to the conclusion that uh, black is completely fine uh, after exchanging queens and going for the end game. Uh, but playing this game he didn't know this and it's a good thing he didn't. Uh, other than this uh, queen to e2 move, uh, an idea is also knight to d3, uh, but Tal was all, uh, only considered this after the game was played uh, with the idea of sacrificing a, uh, a pawn here, uh, but uh, for some rapid development. Uh, but okay, after e5, queen to e2, and now we have queen to e7. Uh, Tal captures, uh, we have queen captures, and now bishop to e3. And now uh, Tal is definitely ahead in development and Botvinnik has to be very careful what to do here. He can't castle queenside, although that would be very nice for black, uh, because the f7 pawn is hanging. So here Botvinnik forces the exchange of queens, bishop to c5. Uh, we have bishop captures, queen captures with check, king captures, uh, knight captures on c5, and now rook h to e1. Uh, Tal says that uh, when Botvinnik played queen captures and he captured with the king that maybe it was better capturing with the knight as the knight isn't really doing a lot of things here on g3. Uh, this bishop is controlling it uh, very nicely but he says, uh, Tal says he, wa he wanted to uh, play a provocative move so he played uh, king captures on e2. Uh, knight to f6 and now b4. Uh, knight c to d7 and now king to f1 with check. King to f8 and now uh, bishop back to b3. 
Uh, and here Botvinnik plays g5 and Tal says this is an excellent move. He really enjoyed this move by Botvinnik uh, as it uh, gets rid of uh, Tal's active knight on f4. Uh, also he's uh, preparing to bring the king over to g7 and then activate both of the rooks. So uh, h captures on g5, h captures on g5. Uh, and here Tal played knight to h3. And now uh, one might think Tal has a weird looking knight here because the bishop is controlling it very nicely. And he has another knight on h3. What is this knight doing on h3? Uh, well, for one, uh, it's preventing black for, from pushing g4 as the pawn is attacked. You can't push g4 if g4, knight f4. Uh, and now this knight on f4 is there forever. There is nothing black can do to get rid of it. Uh, he's controlling all, all of these very nice squares, so this would be a, a big positional uh, blunder by Botvinnik. So instead after knight to h3, Botvinnik plays rook to g8, now protecting his g5 pawn, and uh, here we have rook uh, to d1. Here, uh, when Tal played rook to d1, he realized that uh, he really doesn't have any advantage as a white in this position, uh, but he doesn't want to allow rook to e8, exchanging rooks and then drawing the game so early on as it's only move 20 and he does have the white pieces. So rook to d1, uh, and since now he did play rook to d1, now Botvinnik plays a5. And a5 is a, is a very nice move because now if you, if you want to play something like a3, uh, you get a4. This bishop has nowhere to go. After you move the bishop, bishop a2, uh, you lose the c2 pawn. So after this a5 move, uh, of course, b captures on a5. This was forced. Uh, rook captures on a5, and here Tal plays a, a, a brilliant move. Uh, he plays rook to d6. And uh, it, I mean, it's not a move that actually gives white the advantage or anything, but it's just a beautiful paralyzing move. Now that uh, Tal played rook to d6, uh, you can see that uh, these two knights are covering each other. This knight is protecting this knight and this knight is protecting this knight. So uh, neither of the knights can move as if you move one knight you lose the other. So king to e7 by Botvinnik protecting the knights and attacking the rook and now rook a to d1. And if nothing Tal simply doubled up rooks on the d-file. So a, a small victory uh, if, if, even if not a real one. Uh, rook to e5. It took Botvinnik some time to decide to go for this move, uh, but Tal agrees with him that it's uh, it's uh, the correct move. It, uh, the rook is very active on d5, and uh, you know, uh, move that also uh, was able. Uh, you know, Black could have considered was knight to c5, simply attacking the bishop and then maybe going for the c2 pawn. Uh, but after knight c5, rook to d2, black doesn't really achieve anything here. So, okay, rook to e5, and now we have knight to h5. And this is a weird move, uh, just playing knight to h5. Of course, if Botvinnik captures it, then Tal will capture on d7. And uh, this is uh, idea. This is the idea of the quote above the board. Tal simply played this knight to h5 with the idea uh, of exchanging his stupid knight on g3 for Botvinnik's active knight on f6. So, basically, that's... That's the only idea Tal had here. Uh, and here, if you play, there, there is also some tactics involved here, but only if Botvinnik like, makes a blunder. Uh, for example, uh, even b5, that's not a blunder. But Botvinnik, Botvinnik also saw uh, that if he played something like this, then Tal would have the option of playing rook captures on d7. And after knight captures, rook captures on d7. Uh, king captures, knight to f6 check. And after the king moves, uh, you lose the, the bishop on h7. Uh, but here it, it wouldn't be possible because there is no way for this uh, knight to get back into the game. So uh, e even a move like b5 was not a blunder. But Botvinnik da doesn't want to get tangled in Tal's tactics and he immediately gets rid of this idea. He plays bishop to g6 and uh, bishop to g6, although it prevents an idea like that, which wasn't really a threat, Botvinnik just saw ghosts but you know it, it's interesting that it can happen even to a player like Botvinnik in, in a world chess championship uh, game uh, so this does eliminate the threat of actually at some point capturing the bishop on h7 uh, but the bishop on h7 was also guarding the rook on g8 so uh, <laughs> this pretty much uh, uh, I mean this is amazing because Botvinnik was uh, Botvinnik played a move to not allow Tal to play a certain tactic and because he played it he directly allowed Tal to play this tactic so Tal just played rook captures on d7 Knight captures, rook captures, king captures, knight to f6 check, forking the king and the rook on g8. Uh, king moves, knight captures on g8, and uh, now you can see that uh, Tal has two knights, although they are 
two very poorly placed knights for the rook, but they are two pieces for the rook. Uh, so rook to c5. Immediately Botvin goes uh, to win some material. As both the bishop and rook are attacking the c2 pawn. Uh, knight to h6. Tal wants to activate his knights as soon as possible. Uh, now, of course, if bishop captures on c2, then Tal can capture on f7 with check. So first f6. Uh, knight to g4 now attacking the f6 pawn and here uh, Botvinnik played bishop captures on c2 and Tal doesn't agree with bishop captures on c2. Tal thinks that f5 would give black more chances to hold this position. Uh, simply, you know, you're, you're kicking this knight away, you're not allowing him to capture on f6. But okay, bishop captures on c2, uh, knight captures on f6 and now bishop captures on b3. And now you see this possibility of knight to e4, checking the king, forking the rook, the bishop is still attacked. Uh, well, if you, if you play this, you would uh, you would definitely not win this game, you would um, probably even lose it. Uh, because if you played this, checking the king, forking the rook, uh, the king moves, now you capture the rook. And now if black captures uh, the white knight on c5, then you capture the bishop. But the problem is bishop to c4 check. King moves, now you capture. Knight captures on g5, bishop captures on a2, and uh, you have two passed pawns on the queen side, white has two passed pawns on the king side, uh, but you do have a bishop against a knight, and the play is on both sides of the board, so if anyone can win this game, it's black, but, uh, you know, even if uh, even if it would be a draw, uh, it would be a terrible mistake in this position to play knight to e4 check. Uh, which Tal doesn't. Tal plays a capture on b3, uh, still keeping his two knights for the rook. Uh, we have rook to b5, attacking the b3 pawn. Uh, knight captures on g5, and now rook captures on b3. And here, uh, Tal says he has two <laughs> two uh, uh, connected pass pawns. Botvinnik has two connected pass pawns, but his pawns are uh, escorted by a lonely rook. And uh, as Tal says it, he has two fast horses for the race. So f4, Tal immediately starts pushing his pass pawn. Rook to b1, check, king e2, uh, rook to b2, check, king f3, rook b3, check, king g4, and now rook to b2, of course attacking the g2 pawn, g3, and now b5. Botvinnik also starts pushing his uh, pass pawn. Uh, but Tal has an extra tempo uh, up his sleeve. Knight to e4, check. Uh, now this comes with a tempo, the king has to move, and now f5. Uh, clearing the way for the passed f pawn. Uh, the knight is also controlling the f2 square, so the rook can't uh, go behind the passed pawn. Uh, b4, we have f6, and now comes rook to a2, uh, f7, and now rook to a8, stopping uh, pawn from promoting itself. Uh, Tal plays uh, <laughs> knight to h7, and this is a very interesting move. Uh, because you can't capture this knight uh, on e4. Now, if you capture it, you get knight to f6 check. Uh, king has to move, and now you get knight to e8, uh, simply blocking this rook. Either rook has to capture it, you bring a queen, or if black does nothing, you simply play f8 and promote to a queen. So a very nice tactic, knight to h7. So Botvinnik plays b3, starts pushing his own pa passed pawn. And uh, here, uh, you can't promote to a queen immediately. If you do this, black simply, black simply captures it. After you capture it, I mean, th the b3 pawn is unstoppable. So after this uh, b3 move, Tal plays knight to d2. Uh, we have b2, and uh, this is, well, there were a lot of nice moments in the game, uh, but this is a critical moment in the end game. Here you have only one move that wins the game for Tal. So your Tal, uh, pause the video, try to defeat Mikhail Botvinnik. Also a very nice position to study your end game skills. Uh, you always say you, you want to study the end game, so here's your chance. Uh, so. Uh, for those of you who found uh, the move, congratulations, you are an excellent player. And for those of you who maybe didn't want to waste too much time um, and just want to enjoy the show, uh, in this position, top plate king to f3, and this is the only winning move. Uh, since you have to bring the king over uh, to prevent both uh, c and b pawn. So the king will at some point come to c2, and you definitely can't allow black to reach all the way to d3. If you allow black to reach d3, you, you, you can no longer win this game. Uh, so uh, king to d4, Botvinnik still tries to reach d3, but king to e2, not allowing him. Uh, c5, Botvinnik starts pushing his other pass pawn. Now it's time to promote to a queen, but now the two knights will have excellent cooperation. Uh, rook captures, knight captures, c4 now. Uh, knight to e6 check, uh, we have king to d5, knight to f4 check, king d4, and now knight to b1. 
And here, after playing knight to b1, uh, Mikhail Botvinnik resigned the game, and uh, game 7 also went to Mikhail Tal, so now after, after 7 games, Tal is in the lead, 3 points. Uh, why did he resign? It seems like if Botvinnik would, were to push c3 here, that he's actually winning the game. Uh, because, you know, if you capture it, uh, if you capture with the knight, king captures, then you can promote the b-pawn. Uh, but this was the whole point of Tal bringing his king all the way here. Now, if c3 is played, king to d1 and black doesn't have a move. King e3, simply play king to c2 and after, and after king to f3, uh, hoping to win the g-pawn, simply knight to e2 and uh, now black really doesn't have a move. If he captures the knight, then he can no longer stop the passed pawn, and if he doesn't do anything, white will simply capture both pawns and then escort his passed pawn up the board. So yeah, after knight to b1, uh, a wonderful move to end the game on move 52. Uh, that was game 7, Tal vs. Botvinnik, 1960 match. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as usual, you can check all my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Uh, with another interesting game. Thank you all.